Hey everyone, it's Caitlin from Lily Big Plant. Thank you so much for joining me. We are doing a little plant chores. I just got back from a trip. I was gone for a week and I need to set my little office area back up. I wasn't originally planning on filming this. I was gonna go around and do my thing, but then I realized as I was walking in here that I always have something to say about everything. So <laughs> we're gonna talk a little bit about water and also I'm gonna go around and show you all the plants I have in here. Let's just get into it. Really big plant. So the first thing I want to do is take down some of the plants up there and start the process of getting them watered. They're very dehydrated. I've got some plants on these shelves, mainly this one and that one over there that I just haven't watered in a really long time and they're looking very thirsty. So I need to take them down. Let's give them some water. I've got this step ladder that I really like. It's really lightweight. It has three steps. Perfect for a short person like me. Okay, this is my philodendron heteraceum um, that I haven't watered in like probably almost a month. Never go up there. When a plant gets to this level of dehydration, it usually needs more than just a normal watering. It needs like a thorough, thorough soaking. So we're gonna do that. I also noticed that I have this ZZ plant up here. Let me grab it. It's very, very, very thirsty. I haven't watered this in a while. It looks like this little one down here is probably gonna die off. These are so dry that they've gotten to a point where the soil can barely soak up water anymore because they've gotten so desiccated and dry that it takes a very long time for the water to begin to wick back into the whole system of soil. Okay, so got my little kitchen bowls here. These came in a set. They were very inexpensive on Amazon for these mixing bowls and they all came with covers that do like a decent job sealing. I'll link them in my Amazon store. Anyway, we're gonna take these. Let's come down onto the floor over here. I'm like a floor gal. I like doing things on the ground. Feels comfortable to me. <laughs> okay, so this plant is like horrifyingly dry. Try not to let your plants get this dry. Um, it's not It's not good for them. I'm usually a proponent of saying like, oh, it's okay, you can let it dry out. You can miss a watering, it's fine. But this is, this is more waterings than you wanna miss, honestly. Um, I think if I were taller, I might pour water up there. Anyway, it's my own fault because I put it in a place it's very hard for me to reach and then I like almost never water it, but um, this is a plant that in my experience should be able to pop back from this level of dryness, but it's not like happy. Like this isn't, this isn't how you grow a super healthy plant. Okay. Just to be <laughs> fully transparent. Sometimes you have this soil that's so dried out that when you try to pour water on it, it just runs right through. So do you see how that water just ran straight through the pot? Like that should have gotten absorbed by the soil ball because this plant is obviously really thirsty, but it, the, the soil ball has gotten so dry. Um, to a point that it actually is kind of water repellent. The reason that starts to happen is the unique properties of water. Okay, so I love thinking about this when I water my plants. This is like a physics slash chemistry kind of thing, but mainly just like water is magic. Water is so cool. So the chemical formula for water is H2O, which means that there are two hydrogens and one oxygen. Water likes to stick to itself and as a result, water has some really cool properties. One of them being surface tension. Um, it's the reason why water is able to form droplets on a surface. And that's because water has this sticky property because of its hydrogens where they like to stick to each other. On the layer of the, of the top of water, of any water surface, you get this property called surface tension. And it has to do with the physics of how the molecules of water all pull on each other. And they create this layer that allows water to bubble up on the surface like a drop of dew. And that property is what prevents water from being able to be absorbed into a really dry ball of soil. So the reason for that is because a soil ball, it's really, really, really textured microscopically. And so those little textured points basically form terrain that allows the surface tension of the water to sit on top of it. Water wants to form these drops that want to stay together. And so if the surface tension of water can stay together stronger than gravity, then the water won't go into a tiny crevice in the soil if it doesn't have to. And it's able to take advantage of the texture of the soil to form little air pockets between the surface of the water and the soil and hold itself up above the, the soil. So the reason why a wet soil ball is able to absorb more water is because 
if the soil still has a little moisture in it, when the water touches the soil, the water finds itself and will get absorbed and will wick into the soil ball. So one of the ways that you can work around this surface tension thing, if you're trying to water your plants and have it go into the soil where the water is just running right off the surface, you can add some soap into your water. And this works because soap has these very unique properties. Soap molecules are also very cool and they are able to lessen the surface tension of the water by basically diluting the number of water molecules that exist on that surface. If you put something in between them that doesn't allow the waters to like hold together, the water molecules to stick to each other, then you don't have quite as much surface tension. And actually adding soap to water does something to water that's called increasing the, the wettability, the wetness of the water, which is kind of a funny concept, but um, it makes the water thinner in a sense, because with less surface tension, water is able to penetrate faster into smaller crevices. Soap kind of like thins water out. This is related to, but not the same way that soap is able to wash away oils. That's a different process. I don't know how much of a tangent about soap you guys want me to go down. <laughs> the way soap works on grease, and the reason why soap is able to wash it away is because soap molecules have one end that's hydrophilic and one end that's hydrophobic, which means that one end loves water and one end hates water. And the one end that hates water actually loves fat. Soap is like glue that likes to glue water to oils. Like if you wash a greasy dish with soap water, so you're mixing water, soap, and fat, the soap molecules want to stick to both the fat and the water. So what they do is they create these organized little globules called micelles, where the fat is on the inside and then there's soap molecules all around and stuck to the outside of all of those is water because the soap molecules have this polarity where one side loves water and one side loves the fat and it basically glues the fat inside of a little bubble of water um which is really cool i feel like soap just like does all this amazing stuff that's not really related to how soap breaks up surface tension anyway that's my rant about soap i'm a highly visual thinker so i tend to explain things in a way that's like how i visualize it but i will just put some drops of soap in my water so now i have this soap water solution soap doesn't harm plants because the way that plant cell walls do not have anything that can interface but soap is really good pest treatment um, the way soap works on pests is actually very similar to the way that soap works on washing away grease. Insects exoskeletons have like a waxy layer on the outside that is essentially a hydrophobic, like a, it's almost like a lipid layer. Um, it's, it's kind of got a fatty composition. And so when you hit a bug with soap, you are basically washing away part of their outer layer in the same way that you would wash grease off of a dish. And that destroys their outer coating and it basically melts them. So people and animals don't have that type of layer on the outside. It, it does affect us in certain ways. You don't want to eat soap because the outside of our bodies don't really interact with soaps, but when you eat it, our organs on the inside are susceptible. That's why you shouldn't eat Tide Pods because it's the same kind of process where if you have any fats in there that are exposed, they're gonna get destroyed by the soap because the soap wants to turn it into a solution with the water. So. That's why soap is effective against insects. Anyway, I have a soapy water solution and now I'm gonna pour it into my plants. And the fact that I put some drops of soap in the water that I just used to water my plants should speed along the time it takes for the soil ball to absorb water again. So you don't wanna do this every time because you don't want your plants like sitting in tons of soapy soil. Um, I mean, it doesn't really harm them, but you can create environments where um, it's less breathable because you've got like a filmy soap layer. So this is something just to do only on plants that are like extremely dehydrated every now and then. The plant is rising because it's floating. Because <laughs> it's so dry. We're gonna leave these here and let's keep going. Okay, and then I wanna show you my philodendron chordatum over here, which I feel like is doing really well now. The leaves finally started to face up. They were like, hanging down and facing the ground for a long time because the plant got shipped kind of folded up, which is pretty normal for a plant, especially one that's this big. So what I believe that means is that the roots have finally established and this plant is able to drink water now and it's, it's growing 
happily. So I feel really glad about this because a lot of times when you repot a plant, it does go into some transplant shock, especially if it's a plant you just got in the mail and can look very wilted and sad for a couple of weeks. So it's been like over a month since I repotted this plant and it only just started to look more perked up to me um, since I got home from my trip yesterday. Like I got back, I was gone for a week and then I got back and peeked my head into this room and was just delighted with how this plant was looking because I had yet to see it with its leaves facing up like this. So I'm very happy to see this big philodendron cordatum looking so good. Um, it doesn't have any progress on the new leaf yet. You can see the spike right here, um, but yeah, I'm happy about it. Oh, I should point out, I also tied a plant tie up here. Um, I showed myself using the aerial roots to tie it up, but then I noticed that the knot wasn't staying super tight, so I added a little bit more support there. Yeah, there it is. It's doing really great. Oh, I also got this. I got this from Home Goods. I really, really like it. I feel like it's an awesome plant stand. I really need to get a new desk, you guys. I This is like a pop-up table that I got from Costco. My office in one of the upstairs bedrooms, and then I realized that I really prefer it in here. This is our guest bedroom. There's like a, a Murphy bed. Oh my gosh. Do you see what I put here? I should take this down. I bought this at Home Goods, and I was gonna hang it here between these windows. Um, but I realized that there are some logistical issues with the placement of the holes. I'm not gonna keep it there. Ridiculous. And then let me update you on the Diffenbachia. Hooray! It is looking so much better than it's looked in a long time. Its leaves are standing up enough that I have to like hold the camera all the way up here to show it to you. Um, but it just seems so much happier after getting a pest treatment. It does have a little bit of mites still left on it, so I want to wipe it down today um, at the end probably, but I feel like there's hope for this plant again because I was really worried about how bad the mite infestation was before I noticed it, um, but it seems like it's going to be able to perk up and it's even growing some new leaves already. You can see one here and the new leaf right there. So I feel really happy about that. And then what else? Oh, okay. These plants over here. So over here I have my variegated philodendron giganteum and a random Alba monstera propagation plus my philodendron patriciae, which I have not given it the right conditions to grow huge leaves, but it is still growing and it's got a brand new leaf coming in up there. Um, but what I want to do now is I want to air layer my patriciae. I want to propagate my patriciae because it's looking crazy. I don't think that it can support another moss pole. I've got three moss poles stacked on top of each other and it's looking like, I don't know, <laughs> it's gonna fall over and it's outgrowing its top pole. So let's take these into the bathroom and spray them down and then I will begin the air layering process. Okay, we are back in this bathroom spraying for spider mite. We are continuing to use this eight pesticide, which bums me out to apply to my plants because I don't like using systemic pesticides that act on biological functions when it can be avoided, but due to certain environmental circumstances that I'm dealing with right now that I talked about a lot in my last video, so I won't go into it again. I'm having to use this. Yeah, it is what it is. I think it's working. I feel very hopeful about it because of the Diffenbachia, so I'm going to treat these plants as well. Oh, you know what? That reminds me. I have to show you, I have to show you, there's one plant that is having a really bad reaction and I think it's to the pesticide, so um, I didn't expect it, but I'm gonna go show that to you. We're gonna spray this down and then I'm gonna talk about that. By the way, I ordered a sprayer, a cool one, but it didn't arrive yet, so, and I really wanted to film this video today because I've got like a lot going on this week, so we're, we're still at it with this. <laughs> Okay, so I just noticed that my Gigantium has like rust or something like that, which is a type of um, fungal infection. One of the main problems with pests, besides the fact that they eat your plants, is that they are a vector that spreads disease. If you have like a fungal or bacterial infection on a plant, a lot of times they could be like not that serious, but then you get a pest infestation and not only do the pests attack your plants themselves, but they can spread disease around. I'm not sure where this rust came from, but... I think I need to cut off some of these leaves. 
Okay, this is super sad that I'm cutting these leaves off, but it must be done. Look at that's gross. You don't want that. So when you have some kind of fungal or bacterial infection that has these yellow spots like this, you wanna just cut off the leaves that you see the spots on. This type of thing spreads via physical transfer from leaf to leaf, and so usually the culprit is water droplets or insects. Um, so the reason why I realized I should cut these off before spraying the plant is because I don't want this to spread and I haven't washed this plant off in a while, so chances are it hasn't spread by water droplets. So I don't want to be the one spreading this from leaf to leaf by spraying it with water that then like touches one of these yellow spots and bounces onto a healthy leaf. So I am going to cut off all the leaves that have this yellow stuff. So now that I'm looking at these leaves more closely, I don't know if this is some kind of rust spot. It could actually be due to like a nutrient deficiency. Um, it's really hard to tell because of the way the marbling is on these leaves. Sometimes plants that have this type of variegation um, have naturally weaker cells, essentially, like sickly or unhealthy cells in the white areas of the plant because, I mean, they are... They're defects, essentially. That's where this kind of variegation comes from. Not all variegation is like that, but um, this type of variegation is sort of like an accident. And so I kind of have this feeling that some of the white areas might just be turning brown, like that maybe is normal aging of these leaves. But just to be safe, I wanted to cut them off because I'd be really bummed out if the whole plant started to look like this. It is done. Ooh. But also yay, because we like doing things that benefit our plants. So, Hooray, I guess. <laughs> we can feel sad about cutting the leaves off, but also know that we did the right thing. It's better to be safe than sorry with this kind of contagious stuff, if it is contagious. Okay, what's going through my head right now is I'm wondering if I should not spray the plant when it has open wounds, because I just cut some of the leaves off, and I don't know how this affects like the inside of the plant, you know what I'm talking about? Like, it's like an open cut. Um, if I were being extra cautious, I wouldn't spray the plant right now. I don't really have a point, I just thought I would tell you that's what I'm thinking about. Okay, I'm gonna spray it. Okay, so I said when I went into the bathroom that I was gonna show you one of the plants that did not respond well to the pest treatment, and that plant is the mate tree. To be fair, I'm not sure whether it was the treatment or the fact that I tied up the branches. So if you've been watching my channel for a while and you're the kind of person who's like looking at stuff in the background of my videos, you might have noticed this plant looking like a total eyesore with these branches that stick up that just have had no leaves on them for a really long time. Um, and <laughs> I finally did the thing that I'd been meaning to do for a while, which was to take some of the branches that had been leaning out and tie them so that they're standing a little bit more upright. I did that right after I treated the plant in my last plant chores video. Anyway, I noticed when I got home from my trip yesterday that this plant dropped like a ton of leaves and I don't know if it's from the chemical, like it was a bad reaction to the pesticide or if it had something to do with the fact that I tied up the branches. I don't really think that tying up the branches should have made the plant drop a bunch of leaves like that, but if you make multiple changes to something and then something drastic happens, you can't like rule out possibilities that any of the changes you made were not responsible for the thing that happened. That's just like logic, the scientific method. You can only make one change at a time in order to like learn real information. So I changed multiple things on this plant. I don't know what's responsible for the leaf drop, but I thought I should just warn you in case you have a mate tree um, and you want to try applying this same pesticide. My advice to you would be to test the pesticide on a small area of this plant before applying it to the whole thing, just in case that's what was responsible for this leaf drop. Um, pesticides usually in their instructions will tell you to do that anyway, and actually that's good practice. I should say to do that, but I'm impatient, so I usually just go for it. But if you're not sure about how something's gonna affect your plant, pick a small area, test a patch of it, just like, you might test a new lotion, put it on like the back of your hand before you put it on your whole face, you know? So same idea, you can test a patch of your plant 
and wait a couple days, maybe up to a week to see if there's any effects besides like the intended ones. And if you have die off or something like that, you might want to be more cautious. So I don't really know what happened, but it's, it didn't kill the plant though. You know, it's got, it's got some new leaves, but it looks like there's like burn on the leaves. Like I, I think it was from the chemical. Okay, so there's a branch that I didn't tie up, this one down here. And that branch is also looking really weird and has lost leaves. So it makes me think that it was the insecticide. Anyway, that's what's going on with that plant. Another factor could be that I did take that plant outside to wash it and I didn't think it was that hot out. It was like high 80s. Um, and I think it did get like a little bit of direct sun, but I was out there for a very short time and I was like washing it, it was wet. So I don't think that it's from the heat, but I suppose that also could have been a factor. So I think these plants are done soaking now. Let's see, let's check on them. Oh yeah. Okay, they feel really heavy, so that's great. Um, I just like let the cordatum, oops, I mean heteraceum, I always call that plant a philodendron cordatum. Uh, I let it drip out some of its extra water. I'm waiting for all my plants to dry, so I'm gonna unbox this mirror that I've had on the ground over here for like a month. It's actually the same mirror as the one I got like over in my entrance, but I ordered it because I felt like it was a really good deal. Um, the first one I bought was like 80 something dollars and then this one was on sale and it was like 70 something. cute over there. Okay, so I've got all these books that I brought home that I've been meaning to reunite with for a really long time, um, but they just have not been able to find their way to California. By they, I mean my books. <laughs> so I was gone for this past week in Pennsylvania because my parents just moved there and I was able to finally gather some of my books and bring them here because Southwest lets you take two checked bags for free if you're like a certain status. I didn't know that. Anyway, I brought some books back and then my dad and my sister were gonna be driving out because my sister has college um, out here in Southern California. I'm gonna be picking up a bunch of boxes of books from her. So I'm so excited to be reuniting with my library. Just reshelve it while I'm waiting for the plants to dry before we go and air layer that Patriciae. The saddest thing just happened. I was putting these books away and this Hoya macrophylla or latifolia is on the shelf above these books and I accidentally broke off this peduncle, which is the little thing that the Hoya flowers from and you don't want to break these off because the Hoyas use them repeatedly to flower from the same peduncle again and again. So it looks like it's been through like five rounds of flowering or so and I broke it off by accident, boo. Oh my gosh, I feel so upset that I just did that. You can see where I broke the thing off because the sap is coming out there. You can see that it's dripping white. So, oh, I'm so annoyed that I just did that. Okay, but anyway, this is my cute little Hoya. So yeah, the other two plants that I have in this room are just these two Hoyas, which are like, in very, very, very low light for Hoyas, but they keep flowering over here, or at least my macrophylla keeps flowering. Um, but it probably wants to be in brighter light than this, but it also seems to not mind it. It's been here for like many months now. And then this is my pubicalyx, Hoya pubicalyx, that I've always kept in a very low light location. And it seems to just still be doing okay, you know? Um, I mean, it's not like the healthiest looking Hoya, but it's hanging in there. This is an especially low light situation for a plant to be in because the windows, I guess there's windows on this side and there's windows on this side, but there's an overhang because these are a shelf. So just keep that in mind that when you put a plant here, um, the further back on the shelf you put it, the darker 
it's going to be for the plant and it actually makes a pretty big difference to allow the plant to be at the front of the shelf versus putting it back there. So I had to take my whole desktop computer with me. <laughs> Oops, Uno, love Uno. <laughs> I had to travel with my desktop computer. This case was like $20 or something on Amazon made specifically for the Mac Studio and the pocket is like the most amazing pocket. Anyway, not plant related stuff, but I was amazed at the job this case did. Okay, so you can see from this angle how severely this plant is leaning over. It needs either some help or something to change before it completely falls. So I'm gonna propagate it by a method called air layering. It is a method where you put potting medium or some type of moist material around the node on a plant that is like free floating somewhere on a pole um, and you allow roots to grow into the substrate that you tie around the node and then once roots have developed you can then separate the piece from the parent plant. I think the reason why a lot of people choose this method of propagation is that it really increases your success rate especially if you have a plant that's like a little bit finicky to allow the plant to grow roots from the node before you separate the cutting. So I usually don't go with this method because it is more work to maintain than just cutting up propagations and sticking them in a cup, but I think that the payoff is probably worth it when you do it right. So anyway, I noticed that this plant has a lot of exposed nodes and it's been growing with very long internodal length. The, so the internodes are the space between the nodes. The nodes are the areas where each leaf emerges and the internodes are very, very long, um, which means that this plant hasn't really been getting enough light. But then I put it in front of this window and it's been growing the leaves very close together up at the top. Oh, you can't even see. It's been growing the leaves really close together up at the top. So I feel like it's happy in this location, but I do want to propagate it so that I can kind of start over from the ground up with this plant. I've got my moss and now I'm gonna just begin the air layering process. This is how I'm gonna do it, but if you have a different method of making the air layering happen, by all means, go for it. So you take your little strip of plastic wrap and you kind of position it around one of the nodes. So I'm gonna start with this one. Okay, and then you take your little moss ball, you want to get it right on the little roots. And then what I like to do, because the bottom can be like a little bit too open sometimes and it seems like the moss is gonna fall out and also when well, you water it by putting a little bit of water into the top and you want water to be able to like come through or you wanna just be careful that you only squirt like small amounts of water at a time because when you do this kind of situation, if you bind it too tight or you keep it too wet all the time, you do run the risk of like rotting the stem, um, which is not good. So you wanna keep the moss very lightly moist. The level of moisture is when you wet it thoroughly and then squeeze it, wring it all the way out and it still has like a little bit of spongy moisture in it. That's the level of moisture you're aiming for. Okay, anyway, you take your tin foil. This is also optional, but this is my little trick. Um, I like to just take a small foil bit and like, pretty small and use it to just kind of like hold the bottom in place. And that's it. And then I'm going to do that along every node that I want to try to grow roots from. And this node here already has a little growth point, so that's great news. You also can wrap your plastic wrap all the way around the pole. That's probably an easier way to do it if you're not sure about separating the plant away from the pole, especially if the roots have started to dig in a little bit. I prefer not to do that because in my experience, it tends to encourage roots to grow on the pole because it keeps the pole very wet. But if that's your goal, that's definitely something you can think about doing. Like if you wanted this to root into the moss pole, you could just like take plastic wrap and wrap around the nodes directly onto the pole and that would encourage the roots to grow in a little bit more.
kind of want to get this whole area all together in one big bundle. a disaster, hang on. so excited to be starting the process of air layering these. That last one I did was like a little rough because I clumped a whole bunch of notes together. Um, but yeah, hopefully this plant is now going to grow some new roots and I will be able to chop it up in a video soon. As far as the timeline goes, I'd expect this to take, my guess is it's going to take around a month for this to grow substantial roots into these little bundles. My humidity is not very high and I've noticed that on this patriciae, the aerial roots tend to not really grow. My guess is that it needs very high humidity for those aerial roots to grow and it probably needs moisture directly on those roots. So given the fact that this plant doesn't just have these actively growing aerial roots, kind of like a monstera deliciosa does, like those roots just keep growing and growing whether or not they have something to attach to. Those, if you put the tip of one of those roots in water, it tends to root very quickly, or if you air layered it. This plant, the Philodendron patriciae, its little aerial roots stay tiny little nubs. It's almost like it sends out little feelers at the node to see, is there water right here in this environment that I can grow my roots into? And if there isn't water right there, the roots don't get any longer. So I don't know how quickly they're gonna respond to the moisture. Um, I feel like it could go either way where they're very receptive to the moisture being present or those little roots are relatively dormant as far as roots go and might take a little while to kind of wake them up, so to speak. You can always open these and unwrap them and check. Sometimes you might see roots start to stick out of the little bundle. You can see roots against the surface of the plastic wrap. And then you know that you can propagate and pot that plant up. But yeah, I'm really excited to have taken care of this room and it was fun to just like hang out with you guys because I wasn't really planning on like making this into a video. Every time I spray a plant, I feel like really great that I'm making a little bit of progress because it's really daunting to be in a situation where your entire plant collection is being affected by a test, which is kind of like what's going on to me right now. Basically, if you've got more than like 10 plants that need you to do something to them, it's really easy to feel like very overwhelmed. It doesn't even need to be 10 plants. Sometimes it's even just like one plant. But when it's like hundreds of plants, um, I've just been feeling kind of <laughs> like not gonna lie. I've been having this feeling recently where when I look at my plants, they they give me a little bit more anxiety possibly than bringing me joy. So every time I spray a plant down, I can feel that scale tip back in the favor of feeling very happy about my plants. So far, it seems like things are looking up. So yeah, thank you so much for joining me for this video. I feel really happy to have made it and to have started the air layering process and yeah, to just be getting this room in order a little bit. Next steps, I need to order a real desk instead of a folding table and 
an actual chair for myself down here. So anyway, yeah, I feel so happy to have filmed this video. I feel like I've got this like really cute little area now that I can like stand here and like take a selfie or whatever with some plants. So yeah, I feel really good about setting up this little space and treating some of my plants. Thanks for listening to my rant about water and soap too. Thank you so, so much for joining me. I really hope that you enjoyed this video and I hope that your plants are bringing you joy and I hope to catch you in the next one. Bye. By the way, do you like my little socks? Look, they're like surfing pugs. I think they're so funny. <laughs>